All right, well, it's 1130. We'll go ahead and get started. Marla, if you'll hit the record button. Um, everybody's going to want to save this and, and share it. Um, thank, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I'll introduce our 2021 board chair in just a second. I want to start off with three quick opening remarks. I'd ask that you uh, put on your calendar for Tuesday, March the 2nd at 5.45 p.m. Um, a number of organizations, the Chamber of the City are gonna go together and have a, I don't know, maybe a 30 minute, maybe a little less candlelight vigil at the clock tower. Um, you can park at the train station to reflect and remember and celebrate our victories uh, since the tornado that hit, if you can believe it, it's been almost a year ago. So more details are coming out on that. No RSVP, the uh, um, little glow stick candles um, like they use at the cemetery walk. Uh, we'll have those uh, provided for you, but hope you can make it stop by. Um, some more good news. Um, thanks to our board of directors, um, Tracy Pope with uh, Vanderbilt, Drew Tyrer with TriStar. They put eyes on the board, walked the meeting room, and we are going to be able to follow all safety protocols, but resume in-person networking and some events in the meeting room with a capacity up to 20 folks. So we're excited about that. We're going to meet with um, CJ and Josh tomorrow and see what our networking events might look like going forward, but I don't see a reason why those wouldn't start up in the month of March. So a lot of you've been clamoring for that. We've been clamoring to answer the, the bell and hope you'll be supportive of that and to help us uh, get back to networking and shaking hands and helping each other grow our businesses. And last but not least, on St. Patrick's Day, Wednesday, March 17th, at the Marriott, we will be having our monthly luncheon with a seating capacity of 50 in person, and the rest um, will be able to join us uh, virtually. Um, that will open up shortly if it's not already on our website, and I hope you will uh, be able to join us. I don't have anything else, but uh, at this time, I'd like to ask, uh, now keep in mind, I'm not kidding, this gentleman has been a stand-up comic. And I know that if they don't get that round of applause that they're expecting, they will all say, besides tip your server, they will all say, oh, come on, I, you can do better than that. So let's get it right the first time. You're all muted, so we'll have to do this. But please join me in giving a nice Chamber of Commerce welcome to your 2021, if he's still awake, our 2021 board chair, Pinnacle Financial, Ooh. Lee Campbell. Yeah, Thank you, Mark. How's that? <clears throat> I'm not going to give uh, James much time. I got 20 minutes of new material I'm going to work through. So, no, <laughs> thank you guys for being here today. I'm honored to be the Chamber President. Uh, I would like to just start with a word of prayer, if we could. Lord, we just thank you for today and just thank you for allowing us to live in the great city of Mount Juliet and the leaders that we have on this call and the board and all the folks that really just care about all the businesses and the people in Mount Juliet. We've had a lot of struggles this year, but we know that you're in control, Lord, and just give us open minds and, and hearts for others. And uh, it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we thank you for your uh, being on the call. It's uh, James's first call as mayor uh, for this the state of the city. So just for folks that don't know, I'll give a brief introduction. Uh, James Manis was elected as District 2 City Commissioner in November of 2010. He was the vice mayor in 2011. He's been reappointed as vice mayor four times, making him the longest running vice mayor in Mount Juliet history. Uh, he's married to Tracy, who is a sixth grade teacher here in Wilson County. He has two teenage daughters. Uh, and if you're like me, I haven't heard anything bad about James, but I'm not a good listener. So uh, maybe I'm just not hearing it. But anyways, we're, we're excited. And it's my pleasure to introduce Mount Juliet's Mayor James Manus. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for the uh, word of prayer and the, the nice introduction. And 
I know like so many of you uh, right now, you don't need the mayor to come on here to let you know that the state of our city at this moment is very cold. Uh, we have we have a lot going on. We've probably got a record setting event here where we're going to probably set records with the amount of salt that we're going to use. But before we get started, I, I did just want to say that to to think I wanted to thank our um, our our public works, our fire department, our police department, our parks. Uh, they're out supporting public works right now as as they continue and continue to work to um, keep the streets cleared as best as possible to work and just keep it make where we can travel around Mount Juliet safe, safely. Also mentioned City Beautiful on that as well. Well, Mark, uh, chamber members, Mr. Chairman, I wanna thank you as we get started here. I wanna thank you for making this possible today. And we're doing this over, over Zoom, which is probably not what any of us envisioned, but we've all had to learn to adapt over the previous year as we go through these things. So. Thank you for making this possible. Uh, at, as we got started in the beginning of the year, I wasn't sure how this was actually gonna, gonna happen, as this, how it's gonna happen, but you guys have stepped up and made this possible, and I wanna say I appreciate that. But as we get going, you know, there's one phrase that I have really grown to hate over the last few months, and that's the phrase, the new normal. You know, we've been a less, less than a year removed from the March 3rd tornado and that has changed so many of our lives. Uh, so many of you are still in the process of rebuilding or, or you know somebody that's been impacted either way, but still we see the scars as we travel down Mount Juliet Road, or maybe it's even closer to home when you pull into your neighborhood. But if that wasn't enough for 2020, everyone has been impacted some way by COVID-19. Our businesses have struggled with lockdowns. We've seen some loss of jobs seen incomes disrupted, education impacted and disrupted, and some of us have lost friends or family members in the last few months. So 2020 has been a challenging year for us, but there's no manual on leading a city during a time of a natural disaster, much less a natural disaster on top of a global pandemic. And while that might make a catchy book title or something, I'm also, I'm also very aware that you as members of our chamber don't have a um, manual on running a business after a natural disaster on top of a global pandemic either. Those of you raising a family or trying to care or take care of your family, I realize there's no manual on top of that either. But I'll say this, brighter days are ahead and despite all the challenges There, man, it's, there we go. Yes, I, I got muted there. I saw it pop up, so apologize for that. But I, I will say brighter days are ahead for our city. In many ways, we're stronger than we ever knew we could be. I've seen our churches start streaming services. Businesses change the way they interact with customers. Uh, and here we are on Zoom, and in other ways, we found to stay in touch with each other. Many of you have not only su survived this, but you found ways to thrive in facing challenges that a year ago that none of us thought would be possible or even imaginable for the city. So with that, I get straight into it. Our, our city is strong. We've got a strong city out there. I'm happy to report that. Despite some of the challenges that we have seen, one of those challenges may be PowerPoint, but there we go. Despite some of the challenges we've seen, you know, we've seen our, our police department come together. We've seen, we've seen so many of our departments take things. I remember the night of the tornado very well when we set out. I wound up somehow at the intersection of Fairview and Clearview Lane. And at the time, I, I know like so many of you, wasn't fully aware of exactly the impact of what we were facing as a city, what exactly had happened. I ran into the chief of police and, and wound up stopping there just simply because I could go no further in the city. I basically wound up serving as a signpost because our, the signs in the neighborhood had been removed. I remember directing um, firefighters and police officers down various streets, but you know, they weren't alone in this struggle to, 
to help to help with the to help with the rescue efforts. They were quickly joined by members of Public Works and other members of the city. Wema was there very quickly. It was a long night. I'm I'm sorry to say that tragically we had some loss of life that day. But the next day the response come in. We had our police department. We had um, so many people on standby coming in. And I remember delivering supplies to the police department. And here's something you won't see in many cities. I remember delivering supplies with the IT department a few days later. So it was an all hands on deck. As sometimes one of our biggest struggles was where do we store, where do we keep all the supplies that were coming in? At times we were, we wound up exporting support outside the city limits. Uh, we had so many that it turned out that the community had organized so well, bringing in so many that we were, we had to organize ways of transporting the members to get them into the areas that were needed. You know, we saw the worst of mother nature that night, but we saw the best out of our community. Our community came together. We had groups like Rehab 23, uh, Everyone's Wilson, Mount Juliet for Hope, just to name a few. We had out of state help coming in. I remember being in a, in a neighborhood and running into someone with Samaritan's Purse and they had reported to me that our city was well ahead of where so many were in, after enduring a disaster like this. Uh, they were very impressed by the outturn and the outpouring and the support of our community, the efforts. We didn't just see it in there. We saw, we saw members of our community like Freddie Weston with West Wilson Utility District out working hard to bring heavy equipment in to help serve those that have been impacted. We saw businesses like Robinson Properties out offering their heavy equipment to help clean up neighborhoods in there. No one had asked these individuals to step up and do it. Uh, they're probably a little embarrassed that I mentioned them, but you know, when you're working hard to clean up a neighborhood or clean up or recover your home, it means so much to see somebody out there and know you're not alone. I remember a few days after the event when was everything was staged in the Valley Center and turning up there at that point. And up to then for me, it, it, it had been, a little detached from the emotional side of it. It was a lot of, what do we need? What do we need to do next? What are the next checks and balances on there? But when I pulled into Valley Center a few days later and I seen the support that we had seen received from the surrounding cities, I remember cities like Chattanooga, Columbia, all with equipment stage there. It was at that point, you know, for me, it was really a point when I realized that the city of Mount Juliet was not alone in this struggle, and. You know, they may have sent a dump truck or a chipper truck or a brush truck to pick up, pick up debris, but they'll never know what it meant to me personally, at least, to see that, that they were out there and knowing that we weren't on this struggle alone. And it, it meant so much when you had groups and events like Everyone's Wilson seeing uh, the community come together to see the numerous volunteers go out and clean that up. I know if, if you were impacted personally, that this probably meant more than anything, just to see the community come together and respond the way it did. You know, I've said it before that our city's not defined by the number of houses we have, but with the quality of our people. And on that day and on that month, the city of Mount Juliet stepped up and proved that like never seen before in this city. And I'm, I'm honored and privileged to um, be able to be there and, and stand alongside you as through the rebuilding process and what we've seen. So again, just thank all the groups that were involved, the response, city staff, the volunteer organizations. I know I've not tried to mention them all, but there were so many that come out. It meant so much to so many on that day. Thank you again. Well, as we get into it, I've mentioned that our city is, our city is strong and in a good position. I want to um, start out by looking at our revenue as a city as we transition into the, the business side of the city operations. Last year, we were reported general fund revenues around 23.2 million. So even with everything that we got, we've seen and went through in this year, we're still seeing our revenues up by around $700,000 over last year. This is a big, this is a big improvement in a year that what many predicted would be a, a down year for the city. Uh, we, we passed a very lean budget in response You've seen a lot of budget amendments this year. We just simply did not know exactly what we were going to be facing in the um, coming year. And speaking of that, when you look at our, our sales tax income that had come in there, 
we were at mid-year, mid-year 2020, we saw quite a large bump in our sales tax revenue coming in. From January to March, we were up. January, we were up really nice over 2019. Uh, February, March were up as well. In April, I guess it could be best described as holding steady. That was a, obviously a lot was going on that month with the tornado, the pandemic was starting to set in. By May, when we went into the budget, we'd seen a dip. We'd seen a dip over the year before. Caused some alarms. But when June hit, with the help of the sales tax increase, the people working from home and to some breathe, to, to some degrees for things we can't fully explain, our numbers have been really, really well up. We were seeing it trending in the right direction and we haven't seen bumps like, like this in sales tax increases going all the way back to the opening of Providence. So I've got to say, I, I want to thank everybody that supported our local businesses, supported the community. It's, it's starting to show at least in terms of revenue for sales tax dollars collected inside the city. And that says a lot after what we've been through this year. So we're seeing a very healthy, very healthy cash return, very ca healthy cash reserves as a city. So again, I want to say thank you. Our expenditures, if you look at our expenditures, uh, from our expenditures, you'll notice that our expenditures this year exceeded a bit over what we brought in. And then taxes, that does not take into account that a portion of this, this expenditure chart here is coming from property taxes to a fund. Our property taxes go 100% to our fire department. Property taxes alone do not cover the total cost of the fire department. 12% uh, of this that you see here from road and sidewalk improvements were drawn largely from cash reserves. A lot of those, a lot of that money there is going towards matching funds, matching grants. We're going to get a large portion of that back when projects are completed, but the city of Mount Juliet has to fund those projects when they, uh, as they start out, we, uh, we do hundred percent of the cost. And once the projects are completed, we'll get the, the matching money back. Some of those are hundred percent. Some of those are 80%. Some of them may even be less, but a large portion of these expenditures, at least for the 12% block there under road and sidewalk improvements, the city of Mount Juliet will be getting recapturing some of those monies, those projects complete. Uh, we got a very healthy cash reserve right now as a city. Uh, we're in a good position to do a lot of the projects that we've talked about. Even with the um, even with the expenditures this year being up, a lot of those going to capital improvements. Some of those being as a result of of additional expenditures and cost, along with the with the tornado, we've still been able to, with the general fund, return seven point nine million dollars back to cash reserves. There's not many cities in the state, if there are any, that can say that, and that speaks highly to our board of commissioners in the past, the, the frugal approach that they've taken, the responsibility that they've taken with tax dollars to be able to put that type of reserves back into our city coffers. It's put us in well positioned as we get into some of the capital improvement projects later on in this presentation that I'll be talking through. Uh, we're well positioned to fund that. We were well positioned to endure the literal storm that the city faced. So a lot of props goes out to previous boards, the commissions, the response that they've had and the approach that they've taken. Our staff, city manager, for um, watching our budget closely and keeping things. Our property tax. Going into property tax, I mean, if, if we were doing a, a live presentation, and probably at this point is when I would be asking the trivia question, who are our top two property tax contributors? But not being live, I want to ask everybody to unmute because it'd be a little chaotic at this point. But I will say this, our property taxes are up this year, 2020, over a 2019 property tax. We don't have the numbers obviously in yet for the previous, I mean, for the, uh, the upcoming year, we don't have the projections on those, but we do have the numbers for our property tax in, they're up. You'll notice one thing from our, from our property tax numbers is the numbers that we raise here in property tax do not cover the total cost of our fire department. We have some one-time Im impact fees. Um, Amazon coming online helped us tremendously. Obviously, that's not money that we can count on every year coming in, but it's helped us. It's helped us stay out of the general fund when it comes to running the fire department, and that that's been a blessing to be in a growing city and and have these these things come in these opportunities here. Some of this, uh, some of the money going to the fire department's insurance collections, a very small portion of that. 
but our impact fees this year have been uh, very, very nice and very successful when it comes into recruiting companies like Amazon and other industries and our home buildings. We'll get into residential numbers a little later on have been very impactful for the city. Next item is our, our police department. I just wanted to touch here on the police. Our crime rates, while not final for this year, but if we look at our previous time, our crime rates, are, our rate is at 49 for 2019. That's very low. That's very low. That's one number we, we strive hard to keep down, keep under control in this city. And that's our crime right here. Uh, right now we're showing is the fifth best, which, you know, our goal, long stated goal has to be the best and safest inside the city, or excuse me, inside the state of Tennessee. And we're going to continue working towards that goal as we, uh, we've got some, got some plans for taking that on. Our crime clearance rate, which is 60% crime clearance rate. If you look at that numbers compared to some of the surrounding cities, we are heads and tails above some of those numbers. 60% is uh, talking with our chief of police. One of the better numbers that you'll see inside the state. That means uh, when, when stuff gets reported, investigated, we're able to close out around 60% of those things. Uh, crashes, sad to report that are up 10%. This is not a number that is unique to Mount Juliet. This has been a nationwide trend. Some of that may be attributed to uh, lax, more lax enforcement, and that's just simply out of COVID-19 precautions is trying to keep our officers safe. Uh, we're starting to see enforcement ramp back up, so we expect to see those uh, crash numbers coming back down to um, uh, something probably like last year's where we had saw a reduction in those rates. Uh, we're doing obviously doing improvements throughout the city with our transportation network, but unfortunately we've seen those crashes rate go up in our city 10% now. Overdoses are up 70%. And this is, this is not, these are not numbers that are unique to Mount Juliet. This is a nationwide uh, issue that we're seeing with people being home more often. And, you know, we, we see also see reports contributing to depression and people just not getting social, being able to socialize. We're seeing those numbers trail or seeing those numbers move in the wrong direction on those. Now we're going to keeping our city, our, our police officers, like I said, Staffed at the right place has been our goal. We'll probably, we're on target to hire a, four additional officers each year for the next 10 years. And that's going to bring us to the number of officers. Well, we should be over well over 100 uh, sworn officers at that point that will bring us to 40 additional officers to keep up with our load that we're seeing in the city. We're a growing city. We have to take responsibility for that. We have to put um, plans and and precautions in things and be responsible about those things as we grow. Uh, the police department's done a wonderful job doing their 10 year plan uh, with, the, with the hiring. We are also looking at the police headquarters disaster related building expansion. That is a $6 million project that the city has been able to fund out of cash reserves. Uh, that's gonna be an expansion. We're obviously gonna need more places to house and equip and train those, those officers as we bring them on board. Uh, our sworn officers will increase as long as the civilian staff as well. Uh, evidence is another one that has to be addressed as we're, as the city grows. And in 2020 brought out the need so clearly that we need a hardened police and dispatch center so that in the events of weather, like we saw, that we're able to respond or officers and dispatch can be in a secure location. Uh, the challenges we faced would have been only compounded had we lost dispatch during that time too. So we're taking a proactive approach at this point to address that before it becomes a bigger issue and take those things on. Also with our police department, we're doing a, so, uh, updating our computer software. We're putting smart devices in the hands of all officers. We're doing a uh, hybrid police vehicles, getting 61% more mileage out of those vehicles. We're going to see an increase from 13 miles, miles per gallon on average to 21 miles per gallon on average. That's going to be a needed thing. I think things like the uh, pipeline being shut down, this is probably the appropriate action to address those things. 
uh, Guardian Shield automatic license plate uh, program. While this has been in existence, we recovered a 54 stolen cars, a 25 stolen plates, 21 people that are wanted have been taken off the streets by this program, two stolen trailers, and recovered a missing juvenile in this. Uh, this program, I think many would argue, has been a very nice success as it's been rolled out. I know initially it was um, approached by some with some criticism about the number of cameras that Mount Juliet had and the cost that we were spending. Uh, I pointed out to some people, maybe the question should be at raised. How did the city of Mount Juliet get so many cameras in our program? By spending roughly the same amount as cities that got far fewer on that thing. So I got high praise for the police department or IT department for putting that together, uh, piloting the program. They went, in my opinion, above and beyond on that one. Uh, saw many companies in here, went through many prototypes, many um, proof of concepts on this thing before we wrote it out. Your board of, cons board of commissioners was proactive before the program went live, putting uh, some of the strictest privacy policies in place in the state of Tennessee maybe even nationwide for as your information and being guarded in this, that it's not shared with private entities. It's only shared with law enforcement. That's all disclosed to the public when it happens. So it's been a very proactive. We've had a lot of people that have put a lot of time and effort into that to make this program the success that it is. And we look forward to continue to see the updates on those things. It's one of these, it's one of the programs that you cannot quantifying exactly how many people know about the program inside of the city of Mount Juliet and choose to just avoid the city if, if their um, intent is to do something that's unlawful because of the success of this program. That's one thing we can't measure. We can measure the results that we've seen. Uh, it's, it's been a step in the right direction for our city. Our fire department. If you, um, if you notice from this, this graph here, uh, it's called our fire department, but you can clearly see from this about 60% of our calls are medical response, medical rescue type calls. Uh, actually a bit over 60% of those things. We're actively exploring a partnership with a private ambulance company for ambulance service in here. It's, it's probably one way that we can, probably really the only way and the only option at this point that we have to get additional ambulance service inside the city of Mount Juliet. Uh, our fire chief and deputy chief have been tasked with exploring those options and bringing back a proposal mm. to the board of commissioners. Uh, I'm very excited about that. It, it, it's, it's our due diligence as a city to explore every option that we have to keep our citizens safe. And they're doing a fine job and we're looking forward for new things in the future. Our response time on average 2020 response time, you can see that in the south portion of our city, we've divided our, our city up, obviously, in three different regions here, and that reflects the, uh, our efforts for our construction of our new station up north. The northern part of the city is seeing the longest response time, so it's appropriate to put that station there. We're seeing great response times in the south, and in the central part of the city, the fire station behind City Hall is protecting that area. Uh, one thing, when the north station comes online, it, it's a benefit for all areas of the city. When that area is covered by the new station there on the north side, we see less calls coming out of the central portion of our city for those things. So it reflects back on that, freeing up resources to be available to respond quicker to our central and south area on those. We've also added nine additional firefighters as, as part of um, a budget amendment that we saw a few months ago. We've got those firefighters on, online and that was, it was one needed and one it was timely with the, uh, with the threats that we, we uh, face from COVID-19. Our staffing as, as a city was well below the average here inside, inside the Middle Tennessee area. Our entire shift, our entire department at one point was the size of a shift in the city of Lebanon. And I don't say that to take things away from our uh, fire department and their efforts here but just try to put it in context when we talk about adding additional firefighters and additional resources on these things. It is a definite need for our city, even with the additional officers, we still, and our chief city manager, deputy chief, 
they still operate a very lean operation here. The citizens of Mount Juliet are receiving great value for their, their money and investment in our fire department. If you take a look at our heat map or call locations, you'll see a lot of this overlaps our population centers on there, which is not a surprise, but you'll see some areas on here where we're having, we have a higher call volumes from that. Our, our top three response areas, Dale Webb, Willoughby Station, Hickory Hills, those, those four neighborhoods or those three neighborhoods would rank in the top four as far as neighborhood size in there. You do see some other areas that are kind of outliers in terms of population to call ratio on this. So our fire department is tracking it. And this is one of the things that they use, one of the tools that they used for predicting and resources for the future and our locations of our new, um, new station. Public works. Public works department's been very, very busy in the year 2020. Uh, we saw the completion of the Wood, Woodridge LZ uh, sidewalk project. Uh, we'll see further sidewalk projects being paid for by developers inside the Woodridge neighborhood. Uh, Belinda City Parkway, uh, Belinda City sidewalks there on Belinda City Parkway. We've seen phase one of that completed, the Town Center Trail. After many years, uh, the project, um, we, we joked at one time it took a global pandemic to get that project completed, but it is completed. Uh, it's very needed. It's been very popular. I'm I see, uh, I see the trail in use, even when, uh, even in the middle of a, a Mount Juliet blizzard, we see uh, people still out using the trail. So we've got other projects in place now to tie that into some of the neighborhoods here. Uh, the new park that we'll get into a little later in this presentation is gonna provide a third trailhead. I'm gonna tie those in. This uh, is gonna be tied in through a development outside of Brookstone, giving easier access to Brookstone. We'll see tie-ins directly into Willoughby Station and Mount Vernon. So it's it's going to be a great system. Be able to take you downtown and then hit the sidewalk systems, and you can you're getting to where you can reach a lot of locations on foot uh, inside the city limits, either by sidewalk or greenway. And a lot of a lot of uh, praise goes to our public works department for making those making that possible. Other projects under construction in 2021: the Lebanon Road sidewalk phase one that we're seeing. Um, being worked on now. Uh, the Cedar Creek Greenway behind Charlie Daniels Park, we'll see that uh, go under construction in 2021 and the Mount Juliet Road I-40 overpass widening project that we've been looking so forward to is officially underway. You see what, um, what we hope to see even more of, and that's those orange and white barrels going up throughout our city. And uh, you see those going up, and, and, and as we say in the future, we hope to see even more of those uh, go up in our city. Um, thanks to our public works, the team that they have there, and getting those projects online. I want to just drop here just a bit off the PowerPoint. I wanted to bring your attention to one other item our public works department has worked really hard to get online, and that's our Mount Juliet Capital Improvement Dashboard. I'm not going to go through the dashboard, but you can see we have a, a 28 total projects underway right now in the city that are captured on the dashboard. There's some more out there that will be added as we move into those things. You can click on these, get the information, timelines, funding, all that information. I'll, um, I'll put a link to this here on the Zoom session. And so anybody that wants to can take a look at this and I just got to say thank you to the guys there for working so hard, Matt White, Andy Barlow, for, for getting, this, getting this up. It's a new layer of transparency that we haven't seen before in our projects, and it's very much needed and appreciated as we try to be one of the most transparent cities out there when it comes to um, our projects and what we've got what we've got in the hopper and the fine work that they do. So bringing that to a total of about $34 million active with 10 million plus on top of those active projects out there. So we're totaling about $45 million in active infrastructure improvements in our city right now. And as you saw earlier in here, our general fund budget, uh, this is getting close to our 
general fund budget and doubling that spending than what we're bringing in annually. And again, that speaks very highly of the, the efforts of the Board of Commissioners in the past to prioritize and put us in a position where we're able to take these projects on. A lot of these projects taken on would zero to no additional debt. And there's not many cities in the state that can, can say that. Um, so we are very, very fortunate as a city to live in that. So, you know, as we uh, take a little break from the public works portion of it, I did want to share this as we were, when I was elected mayor, it freed up the district to seat. And part of that, part of that process was interviewing people that to, to fill into that seat. And one of the things I did was any of the, the people that were seeking to be appointed to that, when I talked to them, I, I asked them a couple of questions, but one of the questions I'd ask is what does a commissioner do? And, you know, we get, I got various responses and, you know, some of them's like, well, we, you vote the will of the people and those things. And of course I, I said, well, 90% of the time you may not get any guidance on uh, what the will of the people is. It's not that the people don't have a will. It's just that a lot of these projects and a lot of the undertakings that we take on as a city, uh, you, you won't necessarily get a lot of feedback on those things. So we had one, um, we had one really sharp candidate there who uh, thought quickly on their feet and flipped the question back on me. And they asked the question, well, what does a commissioner do? And of course I responded, yes, you know, so a portion of that is taking feedback from the, your constituents. Uh, I was told when I got in here, just do the right thing, but sometimes doing the right thing doesn't always uh, offer you the correct guidance on what color you're going to paint the building that day. There's no necessarily a right or wrong, right or wrong answers on some of those things. I, I come down to it and the, and the best answer I could say was from being a board member is the majority of my time is spent on education. When I'm talking to people explaining that, well, yes, you're, you may live in the 37122 zip code, but you may not necessarily be inside the city limits. You may live in the 37138 zip code and be inside the city limits. Uh, those geopolitical lines are not restricted to the postal services, the post office that serves those. That seems to be a common question or can I meet you at the mayor's office? Well, people usually get surprised when I tell them the mayor does not have an office at City Hall, nor do any of the commissioners. Uh, some people are surprised to know that your board of commissioners are part-time employees and most of us work day jobs. So um, that's always a surprising thing. Then again, you get responses sometimes that people will call and I think of a, a golf course, for example, that's being considered for development. Get lots of calls about that sometimes and people say, vote against that. I want that to stay a golf course. And you have to, you can say thank you in that response, but generally I like to talk to them and I say, that's that's not the, that's not what's on the table today to be voted on, whether it be remain a golf course or not. It's a question of, do we want this plan or not want this plan? And a lot of time is spent explaining to people that by right, people have the ability to develop their land um, the question before the board of commissioners is, is do you want us to, um, do you want us to support this project here where somebody is asking to develop their land and improve the road and do some sewer system improvements, which will in turn mean that you won't, um, be left with paying for that or do you want to develop it? Even with, a even the property there, um, the golf course in question, you could probably see still is somewhere close to 200 homes being developed out of that project with no improvements at all. So I said, the question before the board of commissioners is, is do we want this project? Or do we want a chance to do another one? So it's not always a, a straightforward question. So speaking of that, we start, started talking heavily about the educational aspects about what the city does, what we're asked to vote on. And talking about that with these, um, with these candidates on here, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't think about the, the educational aspects of it and doing these type of events, state of the city, town halls and stuff like that to bring people up to speed. And that's one of the things that the city with the dashboard that we've just seen to put that information out there. I got to commend uh, staff, uh, police department, uh, city manager for getting out there, doing more live streams and bringing information to people. But another thing that, that come to light in these interviews is one thing most people don't consider about the board of commissioners of the city of Mount Julia is 
is when you're a commissioner on the board, that's one of your responsibilities. One of the other responsibilities that we, we have that we don't, we don't see on a daily basis is we also serve as the board that, that, um, manages the utility, specifically the Mount Juliet sewer system. And that's one that, that rarely gets on the radar. So I didn't want to do this, um, state of the city without approaching or at least mentioning the other half of our responsibilities as a board, which is our sewer system. And brought you a picture here, right down, uh, if you see at the um, right-hand side, is right down a, a live well there. That's the one um, serving the new Springdale Elementary School. I was fortunate enough to get a tour from Mr. Tim Forkham and, you know, learned a lot that day about our sewer system. You can see on the left-hand side, one of our pumps down that serves Central Pike. This is all the infrastructure that goes into making this city as strong and successful that it is. This is the stuff that goes on below ground that a lot of us is out of mind, out of sight. Tim's let me know that we have almost 4,000 manholes inside this city. We have over 175 miles of sewer lines in our network, 30 lift stations, and surprisingly, our city has over 3,000 grinder pumps to support our sewer system. Uh, you can see you don't have to go far in the news to see other cities and the struggles that other parts of the country are having right now with utilities. So I want to take this option, thank our sewer system, thank our uh, water department, our various uh, utilities that serve our electricity here in this city. That's one thing we're not facing in here is any shortages right now. And a lot of work, effort and planning has gone into making that possible. So we're also seeing in, in Public Works the Stormwater Division, 100 and, excuse me, 728 residential permits issued, 616 inspections completed. Uh, streets divisions has inspected and accepted over two miles of new roadway. You know, if um, one of the things that you'll you'll learn as running as a candidate, uh, sometimes for office inside the city, is it it can be difficult just to find the a list of all the streets inside of our city because we're constantly taking in new city, or excuse me, new streets as areas develop out here. So trying to get an accurate map of a growing city can be a challenge. We got a lot of stuff online, which helps with that, but it's, it's a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot when you do two miles, but when you're taking four and 500 yard sections or cul-de-sacs in here, it begins to add up. So it becomes a, becomes a job keeping up with that. Our streets divisions also resurface over seven miles of existing roadway. So a lot of work's going on. Our building department, single family homes, we're setting, um, we're, I mean, we're, we're trending upward as, as you would expect here in the city that's growing. Over 677 single family homes from the building departments reporting for the year. Our parks and recreations department they're growing as well inside this, um, inside the city here. We've got here what, what I uh, affectionately referred to as reverse Oklahoma, also known as the Tomlinson property. This is a rendering of what we, what we may wind up uh, developing this greenways. There's some, um, there's some questions about being selling off a portion of the land for developer in exchange for them building the infrastructure out on the park and providing additional access. So, this picture here is just kind of a conceptual drawing, but I want you to know that the city of Mount Juliet is actively expanding our park system. We just talked about the live and now we're on the play portion of it. So our, our city is actively expanding our parks department. You see the, the Grace, Grace Park there that's right there by United, uh, Grace United Methodist Church behind the Camp Bow Wow and, and Oak Hall. You see we've, we've leased this land here as an additional park system. This is kind of a conceptual drawing at this point. Um, what the, some of the services that we could offer there, but uh, this is moving along well in the planning things. We actually have a board of commissioners workshop uh, this coming Monday on on uh, allocating some of the funds to developing these things out. Also, we recently purchased the Hamilton Denson Park. This is at Tate Lane and West Division. This is also going to serve as the th third trailhead that I mentioned earlier in the public works portion of it. This drawing here is showing uh, 12 different fields being in it. This is gonna be a, a huge upgrade for our park system on this. So 
they have done a wonderful job um, planning this out. The, the parks board has worked hard with, with uh, the parks department, the board of commissioners in making these things happen. We got a lot of great um, things in the pipeline for, for our city in terms of live, work and play. And this is just one example of it. Our city, last but not least, I'll close with this. We've got some active new businesses that are pursuing the city. Some of these are open or coming soon. So just want to thank them. It's not a, it's not a full list of it, but just the, the ones that we were able to add. So we're closing on this state of the city address. I got to, I got to thank Mr. Travis Taylor for gathering a lot of this information and working so hard on this, the city staff for the wonderful job they do with our, with our city for the work that, that they put together to, to current constantly be looking for ways to do things more efficiently to better serve you as the citizens of Mount Juliet. I got to thank our board of commissioners for the efforts and the work that they put in to be so mindful of our tax dollars and their spending on that, that, that we've seen that's put us in the positions to move ahead with a lot of these projects, whether it's moving on to the central Pike interchange, which is planned central Pike improvement, which is a state project. That project alone is set to, to remove as much as 60% of the traffic out of the Providence area. And as we mentioned earlier, the Mount Juliet widening, uh, we didn't have a, we didn't have one part of the slides to mention the, the plans for old Lebanon dirt road improvements, but you'll see those coming very quickly. Uh, Golden Bear widening, Lebanon road, the progress that you'll see work there. Beckwith, all those things in the, in the pipe. And it's, it's been a lot of effort from staff and of course, you as the citizens that have worked so hard to live here and make the city the success that it's been. So I will end with this and, and I don't know if anybody's got any questions or anything, but I'll say the state of our city is strong. It's not just strong, but it's, it's Mount Juliet strong. And Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for the opportunity and the time to, um, to address you guys today. Well, we thank you, sir. Is there any, we had a couple of <clears throat> questions on the feed, but they answered them on the feed for you where the slides were available. Uh, does anybody have a question? Mayor, I have a quick question real quick. You were talking about the, the property taxes. Will the city of Mount Juliet be receiving any state or federal money to make up for the lost property taxes when uh, with the uh, devaluation of property due to the tornado? Not to my knowledge, Mark. And I don't know of any, um, I don't know of any, any, anything in the works to try to recover any of those losses. Um, in, in a lot of ways with the property tax, the property tax on these, on these types of is, it doesn't apply. I mean, they're still saying the same property tax that they would be paying after a loss. Either they have to go in and ask, as that it be adjusted or be reevaluated. But a lot of times these, these properties are building back uh, a home or our business in some cases that are even more value. So after maybe a year or so in the drop, we're going to, um, we're going to be recovering more revenue going down the road as we see these and see them improve or rebuild on these things. A lot of our, a lot of our residential property tax on here, it's, you know, for example, my, my home, we're, I'm paying, I think, about $90 a year on this stuff. So it wasn't a big portion out of that. I asked the question, who was our two, um, two largest uh, property tax contributors inside the city limits? I never got around to answering those. But the biggest, and of course, both of these were spared by the tornado, the biggest contributors, Lifestyles Apartments, is our biggest contributor. And they're contributing, I believe it's around about $30,000 a year in property tax. And then the second largest contributor was um, Under Armour, I think about $27,000 a year. Of course, that's going to be um, probably eclipsed by Amazon as they come online. Well, you know, when this year started, um, and then it restarted again in March, and then again later in March, transparency that you mentioned earlier, I think also access was important. And on behalf of everybody watching today, our leadership team and literally hundreds and hundreds of folks, your Mount Juliet team and the department heads um, Kenny, Jamie, Tyler, James, Andy, I mean, the list goes on, Jennifer, just goes on and on about the
the access they provided to share information. We quickly morphed into weekly, multi, multiple times per yes. week with virtual meetings, what's going on, how can we help, whatever it was. And time and time again, the city leaders, uh, the staff, the commissioners yourself, um, were the, you just answered the bell every single time. And we would not have been able to get that information out um, had it not been for you and, and everyone else that I mentioned, willingness to, uh, to be so accessible and so available, so consistent, informative. And if nothing, I'm just transparent. If we didn't know, we didn't know. But so to you and everybody else, thank you very much. Well, Mark, thank you. And you, you don't know sometimes the, what it's like to be able to, to be, I mean, at the time I, I was served as vice mayor in district two commissioner when this was starting and, and largely most of district two was, was spared from the wrath of the tornado. But, you know, it, it's been many times I've been able to respond, you know, from a city standpoint, they were times that some of the things that, that consumed the most of our time as far as elected officials was, was dealing with, with problems in the midst of all this of what do we do with all these volunteers? We have so many. What do we, where do we store all of this stuff that's being brought in? And when, when you're in my position or when you're, when you're a victim of this, and that's one of the things that, that the people that are organizing in charge of the area are having to consider in the, in the heat of the moment of what do you do with so many volunteers and what do you do with so many supplies that are being donated? That says a lot about the community that you live in. And it says a lot about the area here. It says a lot about the people that respond. It says so much about our churches and, and the, the areas and, and the people that are not just in elected leadership, but our community leaders as a whole. There's, there's places in this country where people are suffering and having maybe not the same thing, but equivalent type of disasters. And they're, they're not dealing with that. They're dealing with questions of who's going to help us. Where will the, where will bottled water come from? And our, our city, and it's, if, if you were here and I think most everybody on this call was, I mean, this, this is a pivotal moment for this community and the response that we have seen I'm still to this day when you, you sit back and just take it in what happened. It, it's still a very emotional, emotional thing for me. Not, not as much so much from the damage or the, the loss that people did, but the response from the community to the loss. I'm just, I'm just taken back by that still to this day, almost a year later, what we've seen and what we, what we went through and what we witnessed out of people. You know, for folks that are wondering, okay, I, you know, we're kind of getting back on our feet. There's still stuff you can do. There are still bricks and mortar yes. businesses in town. Please, before you go push that easy way of buying something, shop local, spend your money here. I think everyone that's seen your presentation today um, can be confident that our resources are being spent, wise, spent wisely and that um, we can help the trajectory that we're on by shopping local. Um, get out, spend your money in uh, Mount Juliet, Wilson County. Clearly it's uh, making a difference and um, we never stop encouraging uh, the buy local. Definitely. And I mean, it, it reflects so well and you're, you're going to see that buy local put right back into this community through, through projects, uh, road and projects, capital improvement projects that are going to be here for years to come. So when you do that one time, that one time shopping, whether it's no matter what it is, when you do that one time, that one time can go into a project that's going to be here to serve the community for 50 years to come. So those decisions, while one at a time, uh, can provide years and years of improvement for quality of life here in this community. Well said. Mr. Board Chair? Doesn't look like we have <clears throat> any other questions. <clears throat> So we thank you guys for being on the call today. Uh, a lot of great information from the mayor. Appreciate his time. We know he's busy and all the elected officials and also our police and fire and all those folks being on the call today. Uh, we are blessed to live uh, in the city of Mount Juliet, Wilson County. So we thank you. Don't forget about the uh, meeting at the clock tower. That's March 3rd, right, Mark? 
March 2nd. March Tuesday, 2nd, that's right. Yep. Tuesday. So make sure you put Five that on your calendar. Yep. And with that, we will let you guys go. Thank you for your time.